first I want to thank all you for, I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. And I want to thank my father and Rich and Chaz for helping out with the cars. I want to thank um, everyone uh, in the film department, everyone in film society. I want to thank Bo Hopkins and Candy Clark for gracing us with their presence here tonight. And um, how I met them, um, I, I, I had the distinct honor and pleasure of meeting Bo Hopkins and Candy Clark, two great actors, um, over winter break in Boston at a car show. Um, my father and I were helping Rich out, um, working on some of his cars for the judging going on at the show, and I, I got to, uh, to talk to Bo and Candy while they were sitting down signing autographs, and they were kind enough to talk to me about the film industry, and as, as a, a young film student, it, it, it meant the world to me to be able to talk to them and for, to, to have their time. And I, I want to thank them again for taking the time to talk to me. I, I really appreciate it, and I'm so glad that they're here tonight, and we're going to have a great time. And thank you all again for being here. And ladies and gentlemen, Bo Hopkins and Kenny Clark. the film. Uh, we shot it in 1972, it came out in 73, and it just seems to be getting a bigger and bigger following every year. Um, Bo and I do a lot of hot rod shows, so that's where we met. He's telling the truth, and um, it's uh, just a thrill to be in a classic film. It was placed in the best 100 films of all time by the American Film Institute. It's number 77. And, um, you know, all the little toy car companies have made the cars and, um, say something, Bo. Anyway, um, <laughs> talk. I'm good. Um, yeah, they're going to make a slot machine, an American graffiti slot machine, so if you see that, use it. And it's just, um, it's just a, a, a neat thing to be in American graffiti. It's, a, uh, it's what we used to do when we were teenagers. Bo and I, we, we didn't live in the same town, but it turned out everybody, I guess in the U.S., was cruising and looking for action and drinks and smoking cigarettes and you know, having a good time as a teen. And uh, so I hope you enjoy the film. Bo? Oh, um, um, uh, Pharaohs don't buy, girls buy. Um, <laughs> You'll see that in a movie later. <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just thrilled to be here, and, and uh, I always like to come out and see who the young, up-and-coming writers, directors, and actors are. So it's fun to be here with you. I hope you enjoy the movie, and if anybody wants to be a pharaoh after the movie, I got the Merc there, and I drag you about a half a mile. But <laughs> <laughs> you're pharaohs. Yeah. Enjoy the movie. So yeah. Just me. Yeah. How was that actually filmed? It. We shot it in uh, different places right around uh, in uh, San Francisco and Petaluma and uh, Sausalito. We didn't have enough money to go, you know, too far. So, uh, Mel, uh, Mel's Diner was in Frisco. It was a real, uh, it was a real, you know, Mel's Diner. So we shot most of the stuff around there. And uh, Paradise Road was, you know, in Petaluma. Um, working at night was the most memorable thing. We shot 28 nights, and so that, I think that's the reason why we all got so close to each other is because the rest of the world was asleep and we were all up together. And um, I think that's why we, you know, 
still, you know, kind of bonded together and we s still remain friends, all of us. We're brought together periodically for film festivals and photo sessions. We had a big graffiti reunion picture in Vanity Fair, April 2000, and even the Yellow Hot Rod and the Black 55 showed up for that, and that was neat. But I think Shooting at Night, that's the only film I ever worked on that was strictly shot at night. I have a question for you, Candy. Weren't you nominated for an Oscar for that movie? Yes, uh, I was nominated for Best Supporting Actress, and I tell you, it was, there's, it was, you know, the, the weeks leading up to that, I never got hugged and patted on the back so many times, it was fantastic. And uh, I didn't win, I didn't expect to win, it was just neat being there, and um, I was sitting on the second row, and then Sylvia Sidney was the one I thought was going to win for Summer Wishes, Winter Dreams. So I was looking down the aisle at her, and I just remember Tatum O'Neill was sitting in front of me, and I was looking down at Sylvia Sidney to see her reaction when she won. I wanted to see it. And they announced Tatum O'Neill, and I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> she was nine, I think. <laughs> did I see Francis Ford Coppola's name on the crawl? Yes, you did. Yes, he was the producer without Francis, who was a, the superstar at the time after having done The Godfather, right, Bo? Mm -hmm. You know, without his name on the credits, the film would never have been done. And in fact, they were wanting to change the name. Now I remember them asking the actors, hey, you know, <coughs> they don't understand American Graffiti at Universal. And, what do you think of Rock Around the Block? And I'm like, terrible title. <laughs> do you remember that book? Yeah. It's like, horrible. So they stuck with American Graffiti, and I, I thought that had a nice, you know, flow to it. And luckily they kept it. They said, nobody knows what graffiti is. <laughs> remember that? Yeah. I thought they would change it to The Wanderer. Just kidding. The Pharaohs. The saga of the Pharaohs. The last of the Pharaohs. I'm sure this is around somewhere, but where did you get all those wonderful little cars? Yeah. And get them all driving and working? Well, Lucas had an uh, uh, open call uh, two day, well, a week before we started the picture, and for old cars in that period. And people come from Stockton, Modesto. Uh, uh, would do different cars, and of course he had uh, the characters already in mind, who was going to drive what. And so he just picked them out, and they were from people that come from all over uh, California. In fact, we've seen the cars. Um, a guy named Rick Figueri owns the yellow hot rod, the real one, and there was only one of those. The Black 55, there were a few of those. And, but he has a, a Black 55 built by Richard Ruth, who was the customizer on that one. Um, I've talked to the guy that owns the, the white 58, and he hasn't shown it, but he's interested. And then we've, we've met the people that own the white T-Bird, May and Clay Daly, and they, they show it a little bit. And then Bose Merck. I'm not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> Bo's Merck. Tell them about the Merck, Bo. Well, I call her Christine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're re we're uh, we're uh, redoing it now. Uh, Richie's doing it. My friend from uh, Boston. He, he's the one that's got the cars out front. So hopefully in July we'll have it ready. You know. Uh, I feel good if I can get in the Pharaoh car again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the his Merc was originally bought by the guy that is a member of that band called Stray Cats, Brian Setzer, Seltzer, Setzer. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was bought by him, and he wrecked it, and then someone else bought it, and then now it's being the replicated. Rest, the rest is history. Mm -hmm. The two of you, did you did you know you were working on them? important film when you were doing it. Uh, were you surprised when it got all the Oscar nominations and other awards? 
I mean, in the process, were you like, hey, this is something more than just an average movie? Well, I was really hoping that it was going to be successful. I really identified with the story. That's exactly what we were doing in Fort Worth, Texas. You know, we were cruising and looking for action and, you know, looking for love. And, and so I really identified with it. And, and I really wanted that character, Debbie. I thought I could just run with that character. And, and uh, I was hoping it would be successful. The, the script was superb. I didn't think it would make a drive-in movie. <laughs> uh, because uh, when I was filming, my part was all with Dreyfus and Pharaoh, and uh, I didn't see anybody else, you know, shooting their scene. And I didn't hear any music. And so I'm rehearsing with Burt Reynolds on the weekend for White Lightning, which was my next movie. I thought that would be the big one. <laughs> Boy, was I surprised. But <laughs> the thing about it is, is once they put it together, the music, the car, the story, uh, when I went to see it, I usually don't like seeing anything I'm in for a couple of years, you know, afterwards. And I remember sitting there thinking, Shit, am I in this movie? <laughs> and I wasn't even paying any attention to, you know, stuff that I don't like watching, you know, that I do. And that's how good it was, you know. I mean, but it was all blended together. It come out at the right time. It was made at the right time. Uh, everybody, baby boomers now, uh, can remember it. And plus, there's things that I, like she said, that we did when I was growing up in South Carolina. We used to cruise, and I think that's why uh, picture. Everybody could identify with a character or something in a movie. Uh, the one night, the, and I think every town's got a Joe DeFaro and a Terry the Toad and a Debbie uh, <laughs> in there. So I think that's why it was identifiable and why it caught on. Music was just great. I mean, once, uh, once it opens with Rock Around the Clock, or I, hell, it was all uphill. <laughs> Usually it goes downhill, but no. And and Wolfman was just perfect for you know that part. So everything just worked. I mean, I never saw Wolfman work until we saw the movie. I got a question. So after you become a pharaoh, <laughs> blood initiation and all. <laughs> I think I've had, uh, it was funny, when I was in England, I was uh, visiting the Air Force Base, and, and uh, they, they let me get an airplane, that, that the F-115, to bomb Gaddafi, and I felt like a king, and uh, they were showing me all around. I was going to actually go up in it, but I didn't have time. You know, the next day I'd have to go. And all the squadron wanted was to be a member of the Pharaoh, so I had a whole squadron of F-115s. <laughs> and I always liked uh, when President Clinton left office, the last thing he did was pardon the Pharaoh. Yeah. He pardoned everybody else. So, huh? <laughs> We're making the film, I know it's a little difference between the, the screenplay and the movie. Was, was Lucas telling you every single thing to do, or did you have some freedom. Everybody seems so natural and so great in their, in their parts in this movie, down to the, the, the smallest <laughs> characters. It's so wonderful. But what, what kind of directions would you get? Or would you just say roll and... and basically, it? basically, it turned out that we didn't get many chances uh, to do a scene. We quickly learned that it was going to be one or two takes, <laughs> and then that's it. We're moving to the next shot, because it was a really low-budget film. And... Um, so you quickly learn to, you know, do it the first time right. And we developed our own characters. Um, Fred Roos cast it, and he just had a way of putting the right people together and that were perfect for the roles. It was just kind of just all the, all the ingredients came together. And George, at the end, you know, after shooting, and Haskell Wexler, had a Haskell Wexler had a uh, commercial shooting studio in in Los Angeles, and he would fly down and shoot commercials, and then come back and shoot graffiti in the evening. I mean, both of them were like 
they were just totally thin and ghost-like at towards the end they were barely talking remember barely blinking barely doing anything and we were all pretty tired because we were working at night and the rest of the world was um, you know in the day when we'd be trying to sleep at the Holiday Inn which is really hard you know with the doors car doors slamming on outside in the parking lot all of us were pretty well beat up by the end of the, the film but um, you know, George said a few things. Did he did he give you a lot of hints about what to do or how to behave? Only uh, technical stuff. Uh, he just basically uh, let you develop your own character. If, he did, if it was something that bothered him, he would say something. Yeah, but we just, you know, we all did our, our part. Does anybody have a, come up with an explanation why so many actors and actresses that were young, just starting out, went on to so many great things afterwards and be so successful. There's probably not another picture where you had that many different people. Because the film was successful, it, we all got was, noticed. Yeah. You know, it was seen by so many people, and it's still being seen today. It's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, it's kind of like being in The Wizard of Oz, and the yellow hot rod is like the ruby slippers. It's just... People just love that film, and we've met people. We met it. We've met so many people that have made the Yellow Hot Rod. One guy we met saw it two thousand times, so he could get that Yellow Hot Rod right. We met another guy. His whole back was tattooed with the the car hop. Mel's driving his whole back. I mean, these are some hardcore fans. <laughs> we've seen the Yellow Hot Rod on many people's arms. So, you know, it's just, it's like, you know, it's just got a huge following, much love. People like to quote dialogue, and I try to stump them by asking them some obscure questions. And, but it's, it's, it's fun being in a, a film that's, you know, like I said, it's number 77 in the best 100 films of all time, and 100 films is not that many for as, as long as film, the film industry has been around. It's just, you know, it's really neat to be in a film like that. You mentioned uh, music, and uh, I imagine most of it was at the post-production bit. Did the, how conscious were you as an actor of the music that was going to go into the film? Uh, what did it shape the way you were acting at all? No, I, I wasn't conscious of any music. I, I was just conscious of trying to get in and out of the murk. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, the only music that we actually heard was in between takes when I had the radio on. I wasn't thinking about the music. That's what threw me when I saw the film first time. The music played a big role in the film, and it was like a one of the main, you know, one of the characters of the film was the soundtrack. They got all of those songs for $40,000. Because those song, those musicians and those singers and all were kind of passe at the time, but now, because of American Graffiti, it gave them back their careers. It's a lot of oldie shows, and a lot of those people have told us that because of American Graffiti, their their careers were revived. A lot of people that make and restore old cars, they got a big boost after American Graffiti because. Suddenly everyone wanted, you know, their Merc or their 58 or their yellow hot rod. And so a lot of uh, restoration places got a big boost and are still in business today because of American graffiti. So it, it gave a lot of people, a, you know, a, a new career and a big career, an extended career. I think, uh, too, all of us had, had work uh, to answer your question. Um, had worked before, but none of us uh, like the Wild Bunch was my first movie, and it only been out just a short time. And I think when we all uh, did the movie together, uh, we had a lot of fun because we all dressed in the same dressing room, and you know it wasn't like any anybody had their own trailer. And so I think we all, once you got in the character and you worked. Uh, like I work with Dreyfus, we go over stuff, and of course, she and Charlie. 
But we didn't, when I had a day off because it worked at night, there was no way in hell I was going out to watch somebody she'd have seen at night, even Brando. So I stayed in the room. But again, when they put it all together, uh, she hadn't seen stuff that I'd done with the Pharaohs. I hadn't seen anything. No. She, except for That's Charlie's first night of shooting when Charlie uh, <laughs> rode that motor scooter and I got away from him. That was real. I laughed my ass. <laughs> part in the movie because he was so embarrassed. <laughs> but I think that um, that the timing of the movie with all of us in, in, in it. Once it came out, you know, people would watch something that we might have done before or after. Uh, it being a period piece, how, how hard is it to get to the frame of mind of being in that era? Can't tell. I just got out here from South Carolina, so I was still in that era. <laughs> 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 it was hard at all because like I said we all know in small towns like where I come from and everywhere I've visited over the years there's always a, a Joe DeFaro and a Terry the Toad and, a, and a Ronnie's character and I think that's why everybody could identify it you know amazing thing is it caught on in Japan the same way and it caught on in England the same way. So everybody must have been cruising <laughs> everywhere, <laughs> even Australia. Yeah. Uh, they asked us to come over there, you know, for uh, graffiti. It's just one of those things that happens, you know. American graffiti, I don't think I would have ever guessed it myself, was uh, $970,000 for the total movie. It's grossed over 285 million, and it's a uh, it's the highest grossing independent movie ever made. Mm. That's th that only Hollywood understands money. Well, I understand it. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think Francis Ford Coppola jumped on to it or was willing to take it on? Because Universal was taking a picture away from George, and he and. Coppola stepped in. He was in Georgia friends. In fact, he wanted to buy the movie. But Universal didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know what the hell was. Was it a drive-in? Would it make it? What is it about? Well, you know why that is. You got a bunch of idiots up there with ties on <laughs> over Universal trying to figure out what it's about. They never lived that kind of life like we did. And so, speaking for myself, of course. Um, he stepped in and wanted to buy the movie from Universal, and that's when they figured that, wait a minute, if he wants to buy the movie, hmm. And so they kept it, and then of course it come out. And Universal takes all the credit now for George, or us, or everything. And I'm not sitting here putting them down, I'm just telling them the way it is. I guess I'll never work the Universal again. Oh. <laughs> uh, did you both work with George Lucas again in, on uh, Radio Land Murders? Yeah. Yeah, we how, did. How much different was it working with him after, after you know, because that was after the first three Star Wars movies, I think, right? Was it a lot different working with him then? Was he a different... Well, a different he was, you know, much more arrested and mm -hmm. much more successful and much more outgoing. And plus he knew us and he felt comfortable, so... Um, yeah, it was great seeing him again and great working with him again. It really was. And we did more American Graffiti. Um, he didn't direct that, but he was, was he, the, he was the producer of that. Yeah, more American Graffiti. So Bill we've, Norton directed it. Yeah, Bill Norton directed it. We've, you know, we keep running into George. Could be my agent. What <laughs> 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 timing. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll cut it off now. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, the postman always run twice. <laughs> also, when 
It was fun because we hadn't seen, I hadn't seen George in a while, and we hadn't seen each other since we were, well, we did do, yeah, we did, well, a we did Rodeo Girl. Rodeo Girl. <laughs> but it was fun to go down, and he directed, for the first time, he directed us, since graffiti, which was fun. I wish the picture had been a little better. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the two of you, of course, have worked with some remarkable directors. Just was wondering how you would contrast working with Lucas as opposed to working with Peck and Paw, and how you would contrast working with Lucas as opposed to working with Nick Rowe. <laughs> That's well, not too like I said, George Lucas at that time of his, he was a lot younger and he was, you know, he was more introverted and tired and stuff like that. But compared to Nick Rogue, who was told you every step of the way of what he wanted and it was a real collaboration and there would be a lot of discussion and rehearsal and and uh, with the man who fell to earth which was the film i did with nick rogue i had the script for like six months before and i could really like go over i read it over and over again and you know took notes and thought of the characters and and you know, had the uh, advantage of having the script way in advance. And plus, Nick Rogue's very outgoing, and, and you know, it, it, his films really have the, the Nick Rogue stamp on them, and, you know, he has an exclusive kind of vision and a way that he does films. And um, it was just more of, <coughs> a, you know, working with the director. With, with George, he was you know, just more, less talkative and we kind of had just to make our characters and, and do them, you know, and hope for the best. I'll put it this way. Uh, uh, working with George and Sam is as different as um, me working with Pee Wee Herman. <laughs> 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 they were that different. They were whole different. <laughs> Boy, they direct. Yeah. I'll get a letter from Pee Wee now. So. <laughs> do, do you think the Toad character is uh, autobiographical about George Lucas, or is it just the, that way too far fetched? I mean, there even well, seems I think in, to be in, some physical resemblance in the There actor, might be so. a physical resemblance, but I think George was kind of a, you know, he had a car wreck. But I think before he had his car wreck, he was kind of the guy around. He was more of a, a Milner type. He raced cars and, you know, he was, you know, he was different in high school. Um, I don't think he, I think he would like to think of himself more as a Milner than a Toad, you know. Or, or a Pharaoh. Or a Pharaoh. Yeah. I think it was more of a bad boy, wasn't he? And then he got into this big smash up and that kind of, I think right. he was hospitalized for a while. And I think he was basing, he based the characters on people that he knew. Yeah, people he knew from and, high school. Uh, uh, like I said before, I, we had a terrier toad in eighth grade. I'm quite sure everybody's got one, but hell, it's not bad. Toad ended up with all the good looking women. <laughs> <laughs> I had the Pharaohs and Richard Trifles. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a difference. And George is a quiet, he's, a, he's always been quiet, and, and, and that's just the way he is. But he's always been smart. Always been, uh, he was making these little characters for Star Wars, his mother told me, when he was in the backyard when he was like 14, 13. So he had an advance. Uh, almost like Ronnie Howard wanted to be a director. Ronnie wanted to be a director when he was eight years old. So it wasn't something that, you know, he did overnight. Yeah, when we did American Graffiti, Ron had his, um, we called him Ronnie then, now we have to call him Ron, but he had a, a film that he had entered in the Kodak contest and he had won second prize and he came to my room and he had a little viewer and, with a crank on it and I put my eyes up to the viewer and I was cranking it and I said, wow, Ron, you've got a real talent here. <laughs> so you're going to make a great director and sure enough, he, you know, 
He did uh, Eat My Dust, I think that was his first mm -hmm. film. Yeah. And he wanted me to be in it, and I turned him down. Darn it, I should never have done that. But, <laughs> but um, I just didn't get that film you when I read the script. <laughs> he wanted me to be in Cocoon, but he said, God, I don't know if we got any people from outer space that speaks with a southern accent. <laughs> <laughs> but I thanked him for having me in. <laughs> so, but he's always, well, his mom and dad were, oh, I did an Indy Griffin's how I got my card. I played Google's helper on the show. And Ronnie was about that tall. We were throwing the ball back and forth. And his mother looked exactly like my mother, so we became good friends. And, uh, still are to this day, except he's in Connecticut and I'm not there, but his dad's there. You both had remarkable careers. Uh, just curious what each one of you, your, your personal favorite film was that you worked on. That maybe it's this, maybe it's American Graffiti, or it's something else. When you look back and think that's the picture, uh, that's the one I really enjoyed doing more than any other. Well, I really enjoyed working on American Graffiti, of course, and then The Man Who Fell to Earth, because that was uh, a really large role that I could really, like, develop the character, plus time was passing in that film. So I was young, and then I progressively got older. And so that was a real challenge to do that. And um, it was great working with Nick Rogue. I had a good time working on Blue Thunder and also Amityville 3D because that was a trip to Mexico for two months. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> also, The Big Sleep, I worked with uh, Robert Mitchum, mm. and that was a real treat working with Robert Mitchum, who would just entertain all the actors in the evening with all his stories of old Hollywood. Worked with John Huston in a film called Fat City. <coughs> it was fantastic working with him. I mean, there I was with a real. You know, a living legend, John Huston. That was the big time. That was fantastic. I worked with Sean uh, Penn and Chris Walken in a film called At Close Range, and that was super fun. And I just, I just have, it's really fun. You know, being on a movie set. It's like kind of, kind of like being in the circus or Cirque du Soleil or something like that. It's just real community and it's you're brought together and you you have to be instantaneously friends you know you have to have have a tight relationship and then you're and it's over with I know myself I have more fun uh, when I'm working now instead of 20 years ago when you know it's so serious I was in the art now I'm in the money <laughs> but I just don't seem to have any. <laughs> so, well, it's good to get out and meet people, like she says, though, because it gives us a chance. I see a lot of fans that, that have written over the years. I never got, to, I never wrote back, and now I get to meet them. And it's a lot more fun. Or a fan. <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> Personally, uh, think that they we sh we shot what we were going to keep. Uh, I don't. Candy might have noticed, but I didn't. I know when I was doing my scenes, we we shot them and George liked them and moved on. I actually didn't have time to sit around, like she said. Uh, I can't remember of anything I, I, out of all the things that I shot at Joe, uh, him cutting anything. Yeah, it was a really good script, and the script is like the blueprint, and you have to, you know, they have storyboards. Did they have storyboards on graffiti? They and, had it, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, that's the day's work, and when you're on a budget, you really have to stick with, you know, what you're going to do. You can't be improvising and wandering over here and doing, well, no, you have to, like, know what you're going to do and 
and do do the day's work. And there's a lot of pressure, you know, with lighting and the sun coming up or the sun going down, and there's a lot of pressure on with time when you're on a movie set. And a lot of time is taken up just setting up the scenes, getting them ready to shoot. And uh, there's a lot of downtime for actors of just waiting for your turn to, you know, do your scene because of lighting and, and stuff like that. So, uh, no, they pretty well, once they get their day mapped out, you pretty well stick with, I mean, you do, you stick with what, what, what you're supposed to be doing. All, yeah. the cars, all the cars coming and going on and off, were there any unforeseen uh, accidents? <coughs> Not that I know of. What? Any car accidents or anything when we did American Graffiti? No. Not that I know of. Only when I'm beating my pants and I couldn't get out of the murder. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> That'll be an inquiry. <laughs> No, not, no, Christ, we couldn't afford it. <laughs> we wrecked the car and it killed us. <laughs> yeah, there was only one yellow hot rod and one Merc and one 58. And there were a few of the black 55s. Two. And, you know, and the people that owned the white T-Bird, they were very particular about their car because that was their car and they still own it. And uh, those cars were... Uh, for a while, the, they were sitting on the back lot of Universal, and then eventually they were sold to just private individuals. And now I bet they wish they had that, that yellow uh, hot rod, the real one. Because uh, we know the guy, and he took it to Europe, and he insured it for fi over $500,000. And that was a few years ago. That yellow hot rod is getting up there in value. <coughs> Does it still have the THX 1138 plate on it? It's, yes, <laughs> yeah. 138. Yeah, he still has that. That was on there when he bought it. George used to sweat all night. We'd have to be shooting the scene where we're going down the street. <laughs> he'd have to cut. I'd have to go around the block and he was like this. <laughs> <in the murk. laughs> I'd get a wheel going out, you know, and come back around. So it was nerve wracking for us to have to drive them and then. You know, you have to be careful, but we wouldn't. I was getting into character. I figured I had to step on it. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like the film was a gamble. Uh, it was? Yeah. Yeah. Any movie's a gamble. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about it, <clears throat> you hope I'll whenever see that one takes a good you do a movie, it's going to be good. Even if the script is bad, you're thinking something. Like Somehow, happen. some way. <laughs> yeah, some Something will happen in this and we'll make it better. So you do try to do the best you can, but anytime you do a movie, it's a gamble. I don't even care. I, the only script I ever read uh, that I thought would be good if they uh, kept it like it was was Midnight Express. Mm -hmm. And they did. You know, Alan Parker kept it the way it was. But sometimes they'll take a good script. That's perfect, and the actors all love it, and then they'll change it. Mm. You know, the producers <clears throat> come in and they'll want to change it, and that's when, you know, they clash. I think the best thing that, well, no sense in me talking about Debbie Does Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Curious how either, oh, how either one of you got into acting. I was going to ask myself a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I'm kidding. Go ahead. I mean, you know, you're from you're from South Carolina. You're from Oklahoma. Fort Worth, originally. Texas. You grew up in Texas, and uh, just wondering how you decided and what motivated you. At what point you realized this is the direction you wanted to go in, and how long it took you to make it. I mean, you know, the early years of but before the fame and the success. Read my book, Juiced. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a long story. Yeah. You know, I, personally, uh, I used to go to movies when I was a kid to, you know, escape from everything. I'd watch double features on Saturday um, two or three times, so I think something would change. You know? <laughs> I, I love being in a 
theater all day, uh, watching the westerns, uh, or any movie really, the serials, the cartoons. And I don't think, I, I think that once I got out of service, when I got into a little theater play, this first time I, I said, I, well, I still can't do this, you know. In fact, I say that now. But the, I think that's what got me interested. And I was lucky I got a scholarship to Danville, Kentucky, and that's where it started. And you went on to the Actors Studio, correct? In Hollywood, yeah. Yeah, I, I went to... Uh, well, I went to Stella Adler's class in New York. I didn't understand what they were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to drop my A, kept me to lose my accent, and I kept thinking if I do that, you know, I won't, I won't be me. Um, Working with David Bowie, he was perfect as the man who called her Earth. Whenever I'd look at him, it looked like he was from another planet, for sure. <laughs> that was easy, <laughs> looking at him. And um, so I've worked with a lot of fantastic actors, and uh, it's just been, a, it's, it's a ball working on movies, it really is. Senator, I refuse to answer that question on the ground that might incriminate me. Uh, I worked with so many good actors, uh, so blessed in my early career, and even up to the day that I, uh, I couldn't say in all honesty. Who did you learn the most from? Huh? Who did you learn the most from? <sighs> um, you mean from people I've worked with or from people yeah. that I've watched? I, well, the, the, I think James Dean had a lot of, uh, of when I was you know, young, a kid, younger, I watched him, Brando, uh, Montgomery Cliff. Uh, I love Gregory Peck, and I, 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 I did a movie for Kirk Douglas called Posse, mm. and I'm glad I did it now. I turned it down at first, but <clears throat> um, I got to go out to dinner with him and Burt Lancaster and listen to all their stories, just like I did on a wild bunch listening to Robert Ryan and Bill Holden. And, and sitting there with them, it dawned on me how many great movies they've done, how many... How, Damn good work, uh, and um, I admired all those guys. I, in fact, I even go back to Wallace Beery, and I just love him because no matter how bad he was, I still like him. You know, I mean, kick a kid, a dog, ah, get on over there, and you still like him. So that's that's, uh, and of course Lee Marvin, I learned a lot from him. But I love the old. Uh, I love Earl Flynn. God, not only a good actor, but you know he liked to go out at night like a pharaoh. <laughs> <laughs> you pick up a little bit from I think every actor that you admire, and sometimes because all comedians steal from all comedians, and uh, <laughs> and actors sometimes will take some. Brando got a lot from uh, Cliff, you know. And uh, um, and I think, God, just to watch old movies, which I love, you know, John Ford and all. John Wayne was a hell of an actor, and he only realized it after he died. So, I mean, you know, because people always put him in their caricature, but he was, you know, you'd watch some of his stuff like uh, Iwo Jima and playing an older guy in all John Ford's, you know, Western. Uh, Right, personal favorite director that, you did work with? that I did? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it was Ty, it's Ty, Stanley Kramer, and Peckinpah. Yeah. How do you deal with the sense of loss after a film? Um, uh, and how do you get your own character back? If that, if you even have to deal with that at all? I mean, how, how do I move when I leave the set? Yeah. Well, at the end of the, the whole production. Oh boy! Well, when I t when I played a lot of uh, psychos, like in the Wild Bunch, I used to be scared I wouldn't come back. Mm. Um, I, after a while, I, I I usually go to the room and kind of joke with myself in a mirror just to make sure I'm there, <laughs> and 
And then when I go on set, you know, it, uh, you get back into character. And I, one of the reasons I love Daniel Day-Lewis is he stays in the character uh, the whole time he's on a movie. It's tough to live with him, his wife uh, says, but he, man, what a phenomenal actor he is. Uh, that's why he doesn't do maybe one movie every two years, because it's tough for him to get it, get it out of him. And then once you do a movie for so many amount of uh, weeks and amount of time, you're into that character and you're into the people that's around you, so it's like doing a play for, you know, a year. With you. It's like a, a family. And so it takes a while. That's why actors are depressed after a movie. It's not so much that they're not making any money now, but it's the fact that they've been with these people for eight to ten weeks. And, and it's kind of sad when it's over, if it's a good experience. I've been on some I wish they were over the first day. <laughs> what advice would you give to people that are going to be going into the industry, the film industry? Any advice? Uh, I I would say if uh, if you could get a picture to me in a bikini. <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> just go, just go for it. Follow what you would like to do. I mean, God knows that when you first start out, it's zero to one million. Once you start, uh, stick with it. As long as and, uh, you know, don't put so much pressure on yourself. Have some fun. Work hard, but have fun. And uh, and uh, go after what you want. I mean, it's one time thing. So it's your life. And and also. It's a, it's a great business, but it's tough. I mean, you got to figure there are 150,000 members of Screen Actors Guild almost. There's 140-something. Uh, and 5,000 actors work. That's a, that's a lot of odds. But then the odds on us being here tonight would be almost a million and one if we hadn't did graffiti. So you see, it it all work out. And as you go through life, if you make it, Fine. If you don't make it, you try. That makes sense. Thank you. You're welcome. Point that gun at her. <laughs> <laughs> For both of you, what was the most difficult role to kind of wash out of yourself afterwards? Well, I've never like got so swept away with a character that I didn't know who I was or anything like that and I had to wash myself. So I'm not that kind of actor that is like a Daniel Day-Lewis actor. Once the day is over, I've dropped it. And then I get back to, you know, the next day I pick it up again. But I'm not like carrying it around with me. Well, that's what works for you. Yeah. Well, he, he's asked, asked me a question. No, but I'm just saying that's what works for me. That's what works for you. Daniel Day-Lewis does what works for him. Okay. Girls don't pay. Guys pay. <laughs> Did it sound like Debbie? Yeah. yeah, I can get back up there again. I just wanted to let you know that that was a thumbs up from a mother who appreciated the advice that you gave. It wasn't a gun. Oh, okay. Well, I hope she... She uh, follows her dream, that's what it's about. She knows how to go after it, and she usually does. Keep it up. Are there any funny stories, like from the set of American Graffiti? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if we got time to answer them all. We should be lining up some. Yeah, go ahead, you can answer. Well, let's see, funny stories. Uh, there's a lot of rowdiness on this <laughs> on, the, on our time off. Uh, we had some bad boys on the set, Paul, Harrison, and uh, I think Harrison got separated from Paul and was moved to another hotel after a while because there was a lot of vandalism going on. <laughs> the Cadillac window got broken with a 
beer bottle and stuff like that. Richard Dreyfus got thrown into the shallow end of the swimming pool. <laughs> Had a big old goose egg on his head. Uh, gosh, so beer bottles wound up on the top of the revolving Holiday Inn sign. <laughs> um, there was a lot of late nights and, uh, you know, when people weren't working, they were causing problems. So... You know, we always had something to gossip about the next day, and Cindy and I were always kind of banded together, and we were very wary of Paul and Harrison because they were kind of like the, acting like the Hell's Angels. <laughs> so it was not around Pharaoh. Yeah. No, and Bo. You know, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I became a member of the Pharaohs. I was dragged and. Uh, Spent a couple of weeks in the hospital afterwards, but yeah, it was worth it. <laughs> worth it. It was just a lousy ten feet. Just a little blood initiation. That's all. Richard dragged us into the swimming pool. Paul, head first into the shallow end. Were they fighting? <laughs> no, it was. I was waiting for Richard to come. We were going to go have lunch, and I was waiting and waiting, and I was like, "Gee." So I'm in my room waiting, and. Finally, a knock at the door, and I open the door, and he's leaning against the door jam and soaking wet. What happened? Big old goose egg. He told me that he was just tossed head first into the shallow end of the pool. Lucky he didn't break his neck. But uh, stuff like that all the time. I can't answer some of the uh, We did. Yeah, what were you different. doing, Paul? I was with the Pharaohs. We played pool every night. In fact, Ronnie Howard uh, got him his first uh, beer there, sitting in the pool hall. <laughs> and I mean, once I had my pigeon, I wasn't going to let him go. <laughs> uh, no, we, we did a few things, but not, not that people knew about. <laughs> Mackenzie Phillips was 11 oh, uh, when we did the show. And she was 13. Maybe she was. But anyway, she was staying with the, Gary Kurtz and his family. Um, who was, he was one of the producers. And Ron Howard was 18. And like I said, I saw his first film that he won the Kodak contest. Second, pro, second place, I think. It was just a, a really fun group. We stayed at the Holiday Inn, and we were really tight. How old was Dreyfus? Was that like his first film? You know, Richard Dreyfus was gray-haired. They dyed his hair. Oh, yeah, wow. he was prematurely gray. He was only in his 20s. Sir. Yes, and he was in a terrible depression. He had broken up with his girlfriend, and he spent most of his time off crying in his room. <laughs> And he wouldn't see the film for like 15 years. He just would not see it, and he finally saw it. But he really turned his back on that film because of his, you know, what was going on in his personal life. Wouldn't watch it. But once he saw it, he, he loved it, and he showed up for the Vanity Fair uh, photo session. He, he wouldn't go in, he wouldn't be in more American graffiti. I think because of, you know, he just had a bad experience. Had a bad experience with the Pharaohs. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> the dragging was very One funny. lousy joke. <laughs> Scratched it, man. Richard was also going through some political stuff, too, because we used to get him angry, you know, talking about politics. <laughs> but he was, he was, he was prematurely gray when he was like 15. I think. Yeah, they had to dye his hair brown. We used to call him Walter Brennan, really. Look <laughs> <laughs> at on the shed, Mr. Brennan. <laughs> we were brought back, we did this thing called, Bo and I did this thing called Movie Lovers Road Trip, and they brought us back to Petaluma like 30 years later. So Petaluma is really proud of graffiti being there, and there's people that like lead tours around. And they brought me back to the place where Toad bought the liquor. And I'm like, this is not the place. This doesn't look like the place. I mean, none of the, none of it looked the same because we were there in the daytime. You know, Movie Lovers Road Trip brought us back in the daytime. And so the whole town looked totally different in the day than it did at night. And now the 
liquor store is a bait shop. The liquor store is gone. Get me a, a bottle of old Harpers with some worms in it, please. <laughs> <laughs> I got to drive both the cars. And, uh, yeah, when we went back. That was fun. I put on a hat, like Harrison. <laughs> I was the flag girl. Natalie Wood. Yeah. <laughs> you keep any mementos from the film? I wish. Mm. Bo's jacket is in a museum. He kept the, the uh, Pharaoh jacket. I kept nothing. Not even the wig. Yeah, he's more famous than I am. <laughs> 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 like Ruby Slippers. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go to Kansas. Go to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. Thank you on behalf of the Film Society. Thank you. I remember that. You know who played that part? <laughs> no, no. Cricket was played by. Uh, Connie Stevens. Dang it, I see. Connie Stevens. Connie Stevens, you're right. <laughs> All right, a man with the. Uh, <laughs> see, it says two cricket, too. Well, thank you. <laughs> I don't give a damn. You know, that's the best ending for a long picture. It is. I <laughs> Just wonderful. <laughs> I did one the first day, and I said, uh, frankly, Mr. Selznick, I don't give a damn. <laughs> <laughs> We'd so also like to thank Richie for bringing the cars. These are his cars. Yeah. Cool cars. No, no, cameras. Cool cars. Put, uh, uh, camera on the money. On the money. Sorry, Rich. <laughs> Sure, we thank you, dude. <laughs> we want to thank everybody, especially this kid here. Yeah, that was his director. bright idea to bring us in, and thank you for that. Here we are at Keene State College, Bo Hopkins and I, and we just want. <laughs> I thought this was Harvard. No, it's Keene State College. I knew we took the wrong turn. I told you. <laughs> anyway, thanks for having us. It's been a blast.